everyone. Thank you all for joining our panel today. My name is Erin Stanton, and I will be your moderator as we walk through data visualization and data data storytelling. I'll quickly introduce myself, and then I'm going to hand it, hand it over to my co-panelists to introduce themselves. So I've been involved with big data for about 15 years now, and I have to admit that I used to think data viz was a waste of time. Up until about five years ago, I had a real aha moment when I realized that a good data viz compelled my audience a lot better. It told my story a lot better than a bad visualization. So since then, I've been just as addicted as hopefully the rest of our panelists. So David, I'm going to hand it over to you to give a brief introduction. Great. Thank you. Um, my name is David Siomo. I work at Humana as the data visualization principal. I also lead our internal group called the Visualization Center of Excellence, which focuses on telling the right stories with our data, but more importantly, coaching, educating, and mentoring on how to do so. Uh, uh, so we are a self-service uh, experience for our local associates and happy to be here. Thank you. Great, and Helen, over to you. Hi, um, so I do mostly consulting work and I work at um, the, I do data science courses um, for Cornell University's online program. And I also um, create courses for LinkedIn Learning that focus on data science tools um, to solve various problems using tools like Microsoft Power BI, AWS, Excel, and R. Um, that's what I'm currently working on. Very cool, and Vignesh? My name is Vignesh Narayan Swami. I'm a data science instructor at Data Society. I teach uh, data science classes, uh, data literacy classes, uh, and more hands-on data science classes related to stat statistics and machine learning in uh, Python and R, um, and uh, really looking forward to, to talking more about data visualization with everyone. Cool. So we figured it would be fun to kick off our panel with probably one of the most controversial data visualizations that exist out there, the pie chart. So give me one second as I go ahead and pull up my screen. Okay, so on the right, we have the dreaded pie chart. And on the left, we have the beloved bar chart. Obviously you can see where my skew lies, but Helen, why don't you kick us off? What are you thumbs up, thumbs down, pie charts and why? So, when we look at the bar chart on the left, um, you can easily see that red is the largest. And what we see is that blue, um, you know, based on looking at those heights, that it looks like maybe blue and orange are roughly tied. And I typically will order them um, if I'm doing categorical data. And if I'm doing time series data, I just do that in the order of in the order of where the time occurs. Um, but the pie chart's harder to measure out. Like if anyone's tried to cut you know, pie so that it's in equal pieces, it's hard. And so pie charts are difficult. It's difficult to tell the proportions apart because we have trouble, um, you know, humans and we have trouble reading a pie chart because we can't, it's difficult to look at the proportions and tell those apart. Mm -hmm. Parents everywhere, I think, know the struggle of trying to cut something equally for their children, right? Trying to cut cut a cookie <laughs> evenly for your children is very difficult. So I, I liked that that point. Uh, David, did you want to chime in? What are you? Thumbs up, thumbs down yeah. on pie charts? I'll be honest. I'm on the fence. I, I generally okay. say I don't like them. And the reason being is because we, nine times out of 10, we use it inappropriately or uh, we're trying to tell the wrong story with a pie chart. You know, it's it's a composition story, uh, parts of a whole. But a lot of times people will actually use pie charts as a comparative story, uh, comparing size and pieces or percentages, et cetera. Um, so I do tend to uh, lean toward only using pie charts if the story really is appropriate for pie mm -hmm. charts. I love that. And I, I think we're going to come back to a couple of concepts you just mentioned there. Vignesh, you, you mentioned that you're focusing on, on data literacy, right? So how do pie charts tie into data literacy and vice versa? Well, 
pie charts are, uh, you, you know, I, I would say that I'm probably three quarters thumb down on the pie chart. Okay. I, I think the, <laughs> the, the challenge is that, uh, like Helen mentioned, the, the difficulty with comparing the segments and, you know, really when you're looking at the pie chart where you're comparing are the angles, which, which is difficult to do. Uh, whereas if you're looking at a, at a bar chart uh, on the left hand side, it's, it's easier to compare the heights. So it's a it, it can be easier to compare the the bar length as opposed to the angles. Um, but w one thing that I'll say about the pie chart that that actually makes it three quarters instead of fully thumbs down is that it's a really common visualization, and a lot of I'd, I'd say almost everyone that I've encountered is is familiar with what the what the pie chart is doing. So that that's one advantage is that it's it's very common, and and most people don't need to be instructed uh, to in terms of how to uh, interpret the pie chart and for for a relatively small number of segments less than less than five as uh, as a rule of thumb i think that it works pretty well if uh, the difference between the slices are big enough that you can eyeball the difference the challenge mm -hmm. is going to be when you go beyond five segments or um, when uh, the the slices of the pie are so similar that it, it's hard to compare them Mm -hmm. That's a really great point around people are familiar with it, right? There might be more successful data visualizations out there. I'm a huge fan of the box and whisker plot, for example, but I pretty much have to explain that nine out of 10 times that I show that to someone. So maybe that's not as successful. And I think that's going to lead, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Um, and that's going to lead into uh, my my first real question here. So um, what what in your all of your expert opinions makes a data visualization successful? And David, I actually want to start with you on this one because I loved, you know, your contextual answer around the pie chart. The way I see it, and again, I need to take a step back for a moment and ground that in order to be a data-driven individual, data-driven company, data-driven mindset, we have to talk about data literacy and data literacy is really just about understanding not how do we not just how we read and write with data which a lot of the folks in this uh, conference is probably familiar with but it's also communicating and consuming it so when you talk about data literacy and you talk about that consuming and communicating of data you're talking about data storytelling when you're talking about data storytelling you need the appropriate and proper data visualization to con convey that story so the way I see it is data visualization is, and I don't mean to downplay, but it's a, it's a means to an end to the data story. So as far as I'm concerned, if you have the right data story and you know what you need to communicate with your data, choosing the right data visualization is gonna be critical, but it can really make or break your data story as well. Because if, again, if you're misaligning charts or misassigning certain visualizations, then you're not going to get the insights and the actionable opportunities that you intended out of your data. Um, so again, the criticality, I also want to just mention that because we do consume visuals, shapes, colors, and pictures 60,000 times faster than words and numbers, visualization is really, really important when you think about how we as human beings consume information every day of our lives whether you're involved in data in, in analytics or not. Mm -hmm. That's that was a fantastic answer. I love doing an exercise with our interns every summer where I introduce the concept of data visualization and how much better we are at depicting visuals yeah. compared to numbers. So I pull up a whole screen of numbers and I say, spot the trend. And they're looking at it and looking at it and thinking they're going to be judged on it. And they, you know, it takes them forever. And then I pull up a chart. And I say, spot the trend and everyone, you know, in a couple of seconds points it out. So that was, that was expertly put. Helen, did you want to add to, add to anything that David just said around what makes a data visualization successful? So I think that one thing that I've approached that I've tried to take, so I'm, I'm, I wouldn't describe myself self as a user accessibility expert necessarily, but I, I think that's something to think about um, in terms of we're not creating our work for ourselves. Like I think it helps us to understand what we're doing, but we're really creating it for someone else to understand. And so it's the bridge between the data and the audience itself. And I mean, 
I'm always looking for examples of how to um, convey that. And sometimes it comes down to thinking about what type of answers is someone in the business or your consumer trying to get out of it. So for example, there's a lot of businesses um, in operations and organizations where they look at data on a daily basis. Mm. And in that case, they're going to look for, you know, something like a calendar visual is helpful um, because you can see when the weekends occur, you can see when the month starts, right? Because unfortunately we don't live in a world of the 30, the 3360 um, accounting calendar. Um, so it's putting it the correct context for how the end user is going to consume it and what they want to get out of it. And the other thing is um, I tried, I go for the approach of I put enough instructions and um, like labels on the visual so that it explains what it does without necessarily, you know, convoluting and, uh, you know, cluttering, cluttering it. So it's like, okay, what's going on? Um, mm -hmm. So it's all about, you know, using that as a communication, using visualization as a communication tool. Mm -hmm. So David was, you know, speaking around the story and, you know, what makes it successful is what conveys your story. And, and Helen, I love that you spoke to both your audience, right? Focusing on the audience, focusing on what you're trying to tell them and making it as easy as possible for them to consume your data visualization. Vignesh, what about you? Yeah, there, there's actually a couple of comments there that, that I wanted to highlight. And, and when I think about good data visualizations, I think about Number one, what is the message that you're trying to communicate? And then number two, who is the audience that you're trying to communicate that message to? Uh, and, and the goal is to me to always communicate in the most efficient, effective way possible. So you wanna communicate that message and you wanna do that in the simplest way possible. Uh, and, and what's interesting about that is that sometimes that means that maybe data visualization isn't always the best way to communicate. Maybe you use uh, a sentence to communicate. Maybe you use a single number. Um, but like you said, when you're dealing with a lot of numbers and it's difficult to identify trends, a data visualization, visualization can be very effective. So the goal is always to communicate in the most uh, efficient way possible. And, and, and depending on your audience, the, uh, the visualization may vary a little bit. Um, a simple kind of a rule of thumb that uh, I like to teach the students is that your audience should be able to understand the visualizations in about 10 seconds or less. Mm -hmm. As a rule of thumb, I mean, it, it may vary a little bit, but if they don't, then uh, maybe it's worth considering a different type of visualization or even considering if visualization is the best strategy to communicate. Mm -hmm. You've already given us two great rules of thumb, kind of five or less for pie charts, and now 10 seconds or less for for my data visualization consumption, which this is great because we, we promised that we would give, give people strategies. So um, as someone who personally is stuck in what I feel like is dashboard land, um, I'm, I'm sure maybe some of our, our viewers are also stuck in dashboard land where these don't feel like data story, right? Data stories. Um, these are not succinct, right? I have a lot of different charts and, and, and graphs and, and all the things in, in my dashboard. How, what kind of strategies are there that you all can suggest to take, to elevate our dashboards, to, to elevate them up to stories, to make them more effective for our audience? And Vignesh, I'm actually going to start with you. You've, you've given us two rules of thumb. I'm, I'm seeing if you're going to give us a third for dashboards. <laughs> I will give you a third rule of thumb. Uh, so, so we have a nice framework that we teach our, our students in our data storytelling class. And the idea is that this five-stage process kind of helps you think through uh, what your data story is going to look like. So it starts with just identifying what your insight is. So what is the message that you're trying to communicate? Which, believe it or not, is oftentimes the, the hardest part of the whole exercise. And it'll really force you to understand what you even want to communicate to your users. Uh, and and as, uh, as data scientists or data visualization experts, sometimes uh, sometimes actually that's not always clear to us. So it's, it's good to understand, you know, what is your insight? Once you identify the insight, you tailor that insight to your audience. So how do they consume information? What do they care about? What are their needs and wants? What are the salient points of the, the, the message that uh, are, are gonna really matter most to them? Once you do that, the next stage is outlining the story. Uh, and, and the idea of a story is that you're arranging visualizations, narrative into this kind of linear uh, linear sequence that has some logical flow to it. Once you outline that, you plot it with a storyboard. 
Uh, so you identify, you know, what is the, uh, how do you engage your audience? You slowly build up to kind of the, the main theme of the story. Um, you have a, a re resolution at the climax of the story, and then you kind of have some closing thoughts to, to tie the story together. Um, and then finally, after all of that, that's when you actually format the story for delivery. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason that comes last is that you don't want to start with the uh, the story at the very beginning. You want to identify, you know, the outline of the story, be as iterative as possible at the beginning. Once you identify uh, the outline of the story and the the main important parts of the story, then you start actually uh, thinking about what the best way to to format the story for delivery is, whether it's a PowerPoint or uh, dashboard or you know whatever presentation method you want to use, uh, but this way, uh, you stay flexible at the beginning and as iterative possible at the beginning. You've said the word iterative a few times throughout that. And I, I think that's such an important um, tool when it comes to building data visualizations is, is understanding that you're probably not going to get it right the first, second, third, or maybe even fourth time. And you need to keep evolving on it. David, what are what are your thoughts on on dashboards and any anything that we can do to elevate those into stories? Yeah, and again, I kind of see data storytelling as, you know, coming to fruition as a dashboard or digital report. I mean, ideally, that's mm. what happens. The reality is, is that um, too many of us have, with the democratization of data, the way it's developed over time, and with the accessibility of BI platforms like Power BI, where everybody can gain access to it, um, everybody kind of has the keys to the Ferrari, but not everybody's learned how to drive yet. And so... What, what do we do? And uh, we've, in addition to what Vignesh has talked about, we, we've got a very similar kind of story sculpting process, but we also add in there the process of EMO, executive, managerial, and operational. This helps us kind of framework not only who our audience is, but most of us have too much data. We don't know what to do with it. And a lot of us try to put all of that data on a single screen. So it helps kind of organize your thoughts to say, when you come into a dashboard, the proper use of a dashboard is that almost high level aggregated view. What are my biggest insights? What am I really trying to say? What are those extremely obvious aha moments? And when a leader consumes that dashboard, it's that person's coming into it with the intent of saying, I'm gonna consume some information, but I have to leave that dashboard being able to either make a decision or be more informed than I was before. When you get down to that managerial level view, that's that executive level view. When you get down to that managerial level view, this is the opportunity to do your drill throughs or drill ins where you're going into a KPI or you're going into a chart to unpack it a little bit, to see what's behind that. What are those drivers? What's moving those numbers up or down or changing it from green to red? Then you can drill through even deeper down to the weeds, down to the minutia of the detail of the data. That can be your spreadsheet. That's your operational level view. But the reality is, your, your, the reality is your senior executives are not going to want those spreadsheets. They're going to want it. They're going to want you to distill the information and then tell them why they should care about what they're looking at. So as you're sculpting the story, think about these layers involved. Humana has over 29,000 dashboards and digital reports in our BI environment. And even though we're a very large company, we don't need that many things. We, we need fewer things and better things telling better stories. And I think a lot of folks, because they have access, like I mentioned in the beginning, to the data and to the platforms, people just get into this evolution of creation, not mm. really slowing down enough to think about what am I really doing? Am I helping or hurting? Am I muddying the waters with putting another dashboard out there? Or am I doing this in a strategic manner for the data to come across to leadership as being meaningful, actionable, and valuable? I loved that EMO concept. I actually was taking notes for myself personally <laughs> to uh, take this away and, and take this back to Vert too. So one follow-up question for me and, and hopefully for the rest of our audience, when you're doing this EMO breakdown, which is just so clear, are you keeping that in the same 
dashboard or are you splitting that out into completely separate views? So do you know how we have, um, I'll kind of draw it back to Excel because it's the most foundational uh, tool that we all use. Uh, we have tabs or sheets. Uh, okay. In Click View, you also have individual, what they call tabs or dashboards. I like to think of the dashboard as the big thing. But the dashboard is made up of reports underneath it. So to me, the dashboard is the experience that the individual is coming into. Now, coming from the world of marketing and advertising, I'm used to creating experiences for people, the, that UI, UX component of this very technical exercise of creating a dashboard. So I think about when somebody comes in, I want the experience to be clearly laid out. They're coming into what I usually call either an overview or an executive summary page of the dashboard, but then it's tabbed out to say, maybe there's a financial tab or maybe there's a more detailed tab. But as you drill through certain metrics or KPIs on that executive level entry uh, dashboard page, it automatically connects you to other mm -hmm. pages within the dashboard. I don't like to segment it out to say that I'm giving you a thing with multiple dashboards, that just sounds really overwhelming. It sounds confusing and it sounds really heavy for a leader to consume. Yeah. And I even, um, I love the concept of even within those tabs, almost saying executive management operational, because it, it sure. just, I, I know what I'm going to get. I know what I'm doing there. That's, that's well, absolutely. And, and the reality is too, a lot of times you'll have operational folks using the exact same dashboard that an executive uses. Yep. And so rather than creating multiple tools right. based on roles, you can create a one-stop shop that everybody goes to, but depending on who they are, whether it be through a directory or something to that effect, they're logging into the appropriate level of mm -hmm. data consumption. Very cool. And so um, I want to transition now into the tools of the trade and, and Helen, I'm going to, I'm going to bounce this over to you. What kind of trends are you seeing around demand in, in tool training? You know, who do you, what tools do you think are coming out with, with new features we should all be aware of? What I'll let you comment on the tools of the trade. So they have features coming out all the time. I feel like even though I spend a lot of time working in all these applications that I'm still always trying to keep up. There's always something new to learn, um, you know, something else to integrate, something else to think about. Um, what my approach uh, is to think about to kind of scale it up, um, because what I found out is, is that when I create something, let me see how they use it, right? And you could start in Excel, you know, create a chart that we could do it in R, you know, there's multiple ways, you know, to do that. Um, and then seeing how that works and kind of scaling up. I think that the, like, so I would say for Power BI, for AWS, for these interactive tools, right? Because um, you can create R visuals in Power BI, but what Power BI enables us to do is we can set up refresh schedules and we can share access so that we don't have to, um, you know, keep an eye on the data on a Sunday morning. So, you know, making sure that those kind of questions are answered, or there's, it's kind of clear what to do to hand it off to someone else. Um, I think that a lot of the, you know, big data was kind of uh, something that was talk, key, a buzzword, you know, a few years ago, but a lot of the tools are exploring options as to how to handle the data. Because um, when you look at, as uh, David mentioned, um, is that often like executives are looking at a high level aggregated view, but you want to have it so that it's accessible for other people as well, because if otherwise they may be looking at the different things, they may be looking at different numbers. And so putting it together um, where that's possible. Um, and I think the other, one of the analogies that I, that I refer, refer to a lot for data visualization is to think of it like a flat pack of furniture um, so if you go to Ikea and you buy, you know, let's say you buy a dresser. Uh, so it's already been measured. They've already measured, cut, made sure it fit together. Um, they've packaged it, you, pur you purchase it, and then you have to put it together. And that's kind of the quickest part because you don't need to measure the pieces. You don't need to figure out how much material you need. But the thing is, is that that's, the Ikea proposition is kind of the, um, 
it's like golden key or the, you know, the ultimate goal of really all businesses is how to make the users feel like they did most of the work, even though that's not necessarily the case. So I would say, um, you know, it's similar to uh, like baking mixes where you add like egg and water, even though they, they could put that in the mix, is that it gives people an ownership in what they do so they can change it and they can update it. Oh, yeah, you know, that they are part of the analysis process. They own the numbers. Um, you know, even if, you know, I'm the person that did a lot of, you know, a lot of the hard work and, you know, mm. hard li the lifting behind the scenes. Mm hmm so you mentioned, you know, obviously you're, you're teaching courses at both Cornell and through LinkedIn, but you mentioned yourself that it, it sometimes feels like a struggle to even keep up with the new stuff coming out. Are there any tips or strategies that you go about to try to keep up with the, the new features and functionality that are coming out of the available BI tools? Um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, blogs to follow, um, updates. You know, I think that LinkedIn is a good place to track a lot of those updates. People share a lot of material that's really great. Um, and I would say uh, the other um, thing is just be open to learning new things. And I'm, I'm open to changing the way that I do things if I think there's a better way to do it. And if the business, you know, so for example, in Power BI, if you can download up to 30,000 rows of data from a visual if someone says you know we have more than thirty thousand rows and we're not able to download it then that's kind of um an indication to me that i need to kind of clarify what they're looking for um from their data what are what are their goals from from looking at it um so that i can you know remodel that remodel what i'm doing so they don't have to download it so they can have easy access to it mm -hmm. Very cool. So I want to uh, remind our audience that we are open and accepting questions for our panelists. So make sure that you get them in. And I actually did receive one question here that I wanted to start with. And, and um, I think Vignesh, I'm going to, I'm going to put this one to you. What, what should someone do who's getting started in data visualization? What, what tips do you have for someone who's just new to data viz? I guess this would have been me five years ago when I had that aha moment that it's, it's worthwhile to, to put effort into data viz, but what, what can you, what can you tell people who are just getting started? Yeah, great question. So there's two things that I would say. Number one is to, to identify a project or, or something that you're interested in, in in visualizing. So that could be related to some work data set that you have or some personal data set that you're interested in. Maybe you really like uh, the NBA. So much data is available and there's some, uh, you know, a, a lot of resources out there. There's Kaggle, there's UCR. There, Google has a, a search uh, engine for searching for data sets. Um, and look for a data set that you're interested in and, and start visualizing with it. And what I'd say is be tool agnostic at the beginning. Really, it actually doesn't matter what tool you use, whether it's Excel or Tableau or Power BI or R or Python. I would say focus on the process of building the visualization uh, first, um, using a tool that you're already familiar with, or honestly, just try sketching it on a piece of paper. Um, don't be afraid to just start getting hands-on with the data and building a visualization in whatever way is easiest for you, whether that means using a programming language or using a tool like Excel, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the, the tools evolve, the tools change, um, but the concepts and the, the principles of creating good data visualizations never change. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would suggest. Find a problem that you're interested in and use whatever tool or method is easiest for you to, to build visualizations with and, and go from there. Love it. And I love that you said, draw on paper, my, I just finished my master's and my data viz professor said, when you get stuck, draw it on paper, we get, you know, even as, as data visualization experts, we have our own bias when it comes to selecting visualizations and, and I'm prone. I, I already said, I love boxing whiskers plots. Right. And so he told us draw it on paper first because it, it kind of removes you from those habits. So I love that you mentioned drawing it on paper here. So I have another question and and David, this one is directed at you. Are, do you run into any challenges convincing senior management to use data visualization and, and the, the dashboards that you all are building or how does that all work? Oh, all the time. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, here, here's the reality again, and I, I use that word a lot because I do think that we live, uh, even though we are conscious of what's happening around us, we live in this world of kind of old school technology. 
as generations get younger and younger coming into the workforce, things are changing. But a lot of us deal with a lot of senior leadership that are of our generation or older. And so yet everybody has an iPhone, everybody has an iPad, everybody has some type of handheld device where they're consuming information visually in very short chunks, whether it be social media or stock markets or advertisements, et cetera. Psychologically, from a neuroscience perspective, we consume information without knowing it. And so what I really kind of help coach our leadership on is the visualization, whether you know it or not, is going to tell the better story. Um, let me prove it to you. And so I will do exactly what you mentioned earlier. I'll show them the spreadsheet of the data, especially our finance folks. I'll show them the <laughs> spreadsheet of the data and then I'll show Guilty them finance person. <laughs> and then I'll show them a report or a dashboard where it's visualized. And there's this immediate like, oh, that feels right. Oh, now I can see it. They don't realize it's happening because it's happening almost unconsciously or subconsciously. Right. So I, I do think that a lot of uh, here's the unfortunate truth as well. A lot of folks think that data literacy, data storytelling, data visualization, they're just industry buzzwords, but they're not. I mean, the, the reality is this stuff is here to stay. It is real. And um, we've got to coach folks that things like skill gaps within our technology forces, um, the data science folks, the analysts, the engineers, the architects, they all have to get up on visualization and color psychology and how to use data visualization, data storytelling. And our creative marketers and communicators and all the people creating the pretty stuff have to get smarter about data and how to use it, and how to access it and what to do with it. Um, we've got to find this middle ground between the two worlds. In the meantime, it certainly serves my skill set best because I've got a whole team of the data folks doing what they do best. And I do the, all the creative visual stuff that I do best. And we come together. Um, it's their peanut butter and my chocolate, right? It's that old yeah. um, metaphor. So uh, yeah, I, I think you just have to plug away at it. You've got to keep showing that it works. You've got to keep practicing the right philosophies, principles, best practices of data visualization, prove it out. Eventually you will make them believers. Mm. You use such an important word there, practice, that I, I've really come to appreciate, I think, with data visualization is it is a skill, I think, that does yeah. uh, require practice. That was that was fantastic. Um, so, Helen, you had mentioned Power BI, and, and I know Vignesh kind of talked about not worrying about specialization. But are you seeing, you know, folks within within your community and the in the learning community trying to specialize, become known as specialists in a specific tool or not? And is there any value in being known as a as a Power BI expert, or do you think people should try to be more generalists? Um, so I use Power BI a lot, but I use other tools as well. I think it's not one tool. It's a toolbox, so to speak, right? Um, it's, I'm, not, I'm not looking to, I mean, I, I think it's good to be experts in areas, but, I, but the technology will change, right? Five years mm -hmm. from now, you know, what's, what are these tools going to look like? Um, you know, how are they going to be integrated? I mean, Power BI only came out in 2015, so it's pretty new. Um, you know, and there's a lot, it, it kind of joined with applications from Microsoft that were much older, like um, SQL Server Analysis Services, and they kind of built it, you know, it's kind of the platform on top in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that there's a lot of, there are many different ways you can answer a question. Um, another thing is that a lot of organizations use Excel, so there's a lot of comfort level to using Excel. And as David mentioned, you know, kind of how to implement and um, you know promote promote using visualizations is often I will put a table next to a chart, and then that's a way to kind of so people are comfortable with the numbers they already have, and now they can see in a different way. So I think it's kind of this gradual introduction. Um, and examples of how they can use it to make them more comfortable, you know, going in that direction. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of giving them 
training wheels and and as someone so the whole reason i i did not believe in data visualization until about five years ago is because i am a finance person and we love rows and rows and columns and columns of of data in excel and so i like that you kind of are slowly introducing it let letting people get comfortable with the data visualization and then maybe at some point you move over exclusively to the data visualization so we only have a couple minutes here to wrap up and i do want to give each of the panelists just one opportunity to give you know Vignesh you've already given us a couple rules of thumb but I want to give everyone the opportunity to speak to one tip that they can give away to our audience um, and it's got to be short because we only have three minutes David I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and start with you what's one tip that we can all try to apply when we're doing data viz story first Story I'm first. gonna yeah I'm gonna harp on that story first the tools doesn't matter what tool you use doesn't matter uh, you know, it does matter who your audience is, but the story is first. It doesn't matter where your data is coming from. If your story isn't clear, people aren't going to get it. People, you're going to be leaving people to have to make the conclusion of what about that data they should be caring about. The visualization in the story helps them or helps identify for them why they should care. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you focus on story first and then figure out how are you gonna build it and what data are you gonna use? Awesome, Vignesh? Yeah, well, one tip I'd say is uh, one thing that really helped me get better at kind of understanding the principles of data visualization was finding good visualizations and also bad visualizations and forcing myself to not just know that they're either good or bad, but try to understand what makes a good data visualization good, what makes a, a bad data visualization and bad, and uh, once you kind of have that eye, you know, oftentimes we have a very intuitive way of understanding what's good and bad. Something just looks right. It's easy to understand. But forcing yourself to understand what makes it good, what cognitive principles is making this visualization good or is uh, taking away from this visualization can really take your data visualization skills to the next level. I love that. I actually keep a folder on my desktop of stuff that I love and stuff that I hate. Um, and Helen, I'm going to let you bring us home. One, one tip you can you can leave with our audience. Um, so I would say uh, that data visualization, um, understanding what people are doing, is part of the process. And so I think listening to what other people want to, want to learn, what they're looking at, finding out, and every. Um, organization, right? Every every consumer, they have something that they're trying to um, optimize. They're trying to, uh, you know, maximize something, minimize something. What are they trying to answer? I'm trying to get to the root of that. So, you know, to orientate, um, you know, the visuals in that way, and and to that extent, also, um, you know, I try to focus on one thing at once. You know, kind of asking and understanding one question at a time, and building it from there, kind of one piece by piece. I love that. So make it make it easy and, and approachable. Start small and then build on that. So this was absolutely fantastic. And I wanted to thank all of our panelists and the audience for joining us today. I think Dr. Joe, I'm handing it back over to you, hopefully. <laughs> yep, I'm here. Hi. Oh, my goodness. This is like a uh, this is a wonderful reunion to see all you guys again. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Aaron and Big Nesh and David. And <coughs> excuse me, and Aaron. Uh, you, uh, you guys are just absolutely phenomenal, touching on the things that I am just the most passionate about when it comes to uh, uh, to data visualizations. Uh, uh, I was supposed to have been on mute, and I probably wasn't. I really started chuckling, tried to restrain myself when you guys were going off on that on those pie charts. You know, um, it's it's a thing I, I like to say. Um, uh, pie charts, you never know about them. Some people think they're the best thing since sliced bread, while others say they're the spawn of the devil himself. You know, and it, 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 it's not, it, it's just a tool, right? It's, and all of these things are tools, right? It's how you use them. The tool is neither good nor bad. Hey everyone, I'm touched. It's in the hands of the person wielding the tool. So um, you guys just really took us through that in a very, uh, applicable, very actionable, very practical, and very, I don't know, you've achieved both relevance and resonance uh, with, with this panel. So uh, I'm very grateful to all of you for uh, the wonderful insights that you, um, that you brought to the table this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.